Amen. Well, it's time to get into our sermon this morning. If you could turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says right here, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. He says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. You know, right here we find in Revelation, Jesus sending a message to the Apostle John. At this time, we know that John was exiled onto the island of Patmos, and in fact, historically, it's recorded by uh, the famous uh, extra-biblical historian Tertullian that John had been boiled in oil in the Roman Colosseum in front of all these different people and still survived. And after he survived, the crowd saw this, and all of a sudden, they wanted to become Christians. And so here the emperor of Rome just goes, I don't know what to do with this guy. He won't die, and everybody wants to become Christians because of him. And so he exiles him to the island of Patmos. And it's here that Jesus appears to the apostle John, giving him a, quote, revelation of the spiritual realities that would explain the spiritual circumstances or the physical circumstances that John was experiencing right there in the first century. The letter that Jesus gives or the vision that Jesus gives to John was meant for John, for all of the disciples, but it's specifically addressed right here to the seven churches of Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, believe it or not, these were not the only churches in Asia in the first century. In fact, even in the Bible, the Bible records that Troas was there as a church. There's a church in Colossae. There's a church in the uh, city of Heropolis, and also in the city of Miletus. But, but Jesus gives John a vision to seven churches, the number seven representing perfection or completeness. So in a sense, because it's addressed to these seven churches, it's addressed to all Christians, the perfect number, number seven. But, but some also say that these seven churches represented the seven postal districts in the, the province of Asia. And so either way, Jesus' message to the seven churches was a message for all disciples in their generation and all disciples even in our generation. And we're going to look at these seven churches this morning for our sermon. What's the message that Jesus has for all of the seven churches? What's the message Jesus had for all of the first century disciples and even for us? Well, it's very clear because in each of the sections to the churches, he closes off with, to the one who is victorious. The, the message was all about being victorious for Christ. And so the title of our lesson this morning is simply victorious. Victorious. Let's go to our, our first church as we look at the seven churches in Asia. Let's go to the church in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, to the angel... Of the church in Ephesus writes, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Consider how you far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
to the one who is victorious, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. You know, right here, Jesus, in addressing that church in Ephesus, he says, those or these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. You go, well, what is Jesus referring to right here? Well, the seven stars represented the seven messengers to the church. You could say right here, it was addressed to the angel of the church, but really more likely it's addressed to the church leader of these churches, those that were messengers, those that were in charge of preaching the word of God in each of these seven cities. Well, the seven golden lampstands represent the church themselves. And so you've got seven stars and you've got seven golden lampstands. And the Bible says that Jesus is walking among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus is walking among the churches. Is that incredible right there? That even as we work here in the Toronto church, uh, we know that Jesus is walking among his churches here in Toronto, but also all around the movement. You know, this past uh, week, my wife and I were fortunate enough to get a, a little miniature vacation. And uh, because uh, the wedding that we had last week was in Tweed, uh, we found a little city next door uh, called Kingston. You may have heard of Kingston. And we decided to take a, a little vacation, two or three days uh, in Kingston. And so we, we took the kids there, hung out, and we had an incredible time. And it was so fun because that was the first time we'd ever been to Kingston. And so we were just, you know, going around taking pictures and looking at the different historical sites there in Kingston. And we drove across uh, to the ferry and then took the ferry across to Wolf Island. And uh, it was just a, a blast there in Kingston. And it was fun being tourists, as I said. But, you know, uh, Jesus, like us, is walking among his churches. But, but different than us in Kingston, Jesus is not a tourist. He should be a resident in the church. Amen? He should be living with his church, not a tourist to the church. And sadly, for some churches, because they're not following Jesus, Jesus is still walking among them, but he's a tourist instead of a resident. Let's keep going. You know, right here in verse 2, Jesus goes, I know your deeds. Now, one of the challenges, I think, uh, of us having a growing church is that sometimes as we, we grow as a church and the church becomes bigger, it gets easier for us to hide out in the fellowship as Christians. And right here, it's pretty clear. Jesus goes, I know your deeds. See, you can't, you can't hide from Jesus. You can't hide from God. He knows your deeds. Now, it doesn't say that Jesus knows your intentions. It doesn't say that he knows your thoughts. Jesus knows your deeds. And so prayerfully, that fires you up and doesn't terrify you. Amen? Well, he goes on, and he starts kind of going through the different deeds that were there in the church at Ephesus. He goes, I know your good deeds, that you've worked hard. I, I know that you've persevered. I, I know that you haven't tolerated sin. You've actually dealt with sin in the church. And I, I know that you've endured hardships and have not grown tired or weary. You know, these guys in Ephesus were, were all about the to-dos of Christianity. They were all about working hard. They were all about persevering. They were all about not tolerating sin and really being confrontational. There was a lot of things that Jesus commended right here in the church at Ephesus. And yet in verse 4, Jesus goes, But I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You know, it was awesome uh, last week to see the wedding of, of Liz and Isaiah Fonruewa. And uh, although they haven't gotten a chance to go on their, their extended honeymoon, uh, they did get a chance because of the, the restrictions of the country and, and you know, the two-week quarantine that you have to have if you come back into Canada, that they did get a chance to take a little mini honeymoon. And my wife and I went over to Belleville, view on, uh, or Belleville on Monday to pick them up. And it was so fun to see the, the glow of Liz and Isaiah, uh, freshly married. And, and you know how it is when you've got that, that first love feeling, where you got butterflies in your, in your belly, and you're just excited. You're excited for the fact that God has given you this new relationship. You know, it's awesome. We, we just got to see uh, yesterday 
Tim asked Adriana Pantone uh, to uh, be his girlfriend. And so congratulations, Tim and Adriana. Once again, a first love here in the church is brewing. But you know, as time goes on in our relationships, uh, really we can, we can start to lose that sense of that, that newness or that excitement or that zeal that we had at first. You know, it's been said that there are three stages of a relationship. There's the acquaintance stage, there's the conflict stage, and then there's a stage where you get to intimacy in a relationship. You know, I think in the acquaintance stage, it's easy to be excited because you're really not dealing with a whole lot. Everything's new, everything's fun, you're just starting to get to know the other person. And likewise, in our relationship with God, when we're in the acquaintance stage, everything's exciting, everything's new, we're experiencing our, our new relationship with God and uh, the new parts of the kingdom of God that we didn't uh, quite understand but now are experiencing for the first time. But then you go to that second stage and, and it becomes a, a very challenging stage, the conflict stage. And in conflict is when you realize that the person that you're dating is not perfect. You know, I know it's easy to think of, of each other as just being perfect when you're, when you're attracted to someone and that that person has no flaws and is just awesome all the way around. But when you start experiencing that conflict stage, you start to see, oh, wow, they're, they're, they're not perfect. That there are some flaws in their life. There are some things that they do that annoy me or irritate me. I think Liz was sharing uh, that Isaiah likes to clean first thing in the morning. And so he'll get out of bed and start cleaning up everything. And Liz is trying to sleep a little bit. And so it can become annoying. That's the conflict stage of a relationship. Now, different than our worldly relationships, God is completely perfect. And yet we still have to experience conflict in our relationship with God, not because of God being imperfect, but because of our own imperfections. And God has to discipline us so that we can grow and become more and more like him. But after you get through the conflict stage, you can finally get to a stage of intimacy in a relationship. For a marriage, it means that you're going to have a greater loyalty, a greater depth in your relationship. Uh, for a friendship, the same is true. In our relationship with God, it's also true that as we go through challenges, as we fight through hardships, as we age spiritually and have gone through a few things, we can reach a greater depth in our relationship with God and experience a type of intimacy with God that we've never felt before. That being said, sometimes, although there's a greater depth when we get to a place of intimacy with God, one of the things that can be lost as we uh, go through conflict is our enthusiasm, is our zeal for the Lord. You know, the word enthusiasm in Greek is the word en, meaning in, and theism, meaning God. What is enthusiasm? It's literally God in you. And as disciples, we've got to make sure that we're not just going through the motions spiritually, that we're not just working hard or, or persevering or, or dealing with sin, but we're also fired up about our relationship with God and that we've got that, that newness of a, that first love still in our hearts, in our relationship with God, even as we age. You know, I love the, uh, just the, the new baptisms that we've had in the church sharing about what they love about the kingdom of God. And I think that, that that's really the heart that we all have to have, that everything feels new even as we age spiritually. You know, if you've lost your enthusiasm, I want to challenge you to consider how far you've fallen. But, but also not just to consider how far you've fallen, but to repent and have that same heart, that first love heart, that you had when you first became a disciple. I don't know about you, but I've never seen somebody baptized who's not fired up. I mean, everybody comes out of the water just so fired up about their relationship with God. Well, I hope that you still feel that sense of fire and excitement and enthusiasm even now as you've aged as a Christian. That There's nothing more exciting than being a disciple. There's nothing more exciting than being a part of the kingdom of God. Let's go on to our second church, the church in Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. The Bible says, To the angel in the church of Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, and who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you as life your victor's crown. Or I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Does that fire you up right there? You know, right here, as Jesus addresses the church in Smyrna, he says, I, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not. In fact, they are a synagogue of Satan. You go, well, how could someone think that they are a, a Jew but are not? Well, it's very interesting because in the Old Testament, we understand that God's people were God's physical people, the, the Jews, the Israelites. And then in the New Testament, uh, God's people are, are represented by Christianity, the, the spiritual family of God, the spiritual people of God, no longer the Jews. And I think in a sense, there, there's a reason for that because God always tried to foreshadow the spiritual realities of life through using physical examples. For example, when Jesus was baptized, we, we know that the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus in the form of a physical dove. But at the same time, we know that when we're baptized, we receive the Spirit not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. Why did God have to show us through a physical representation of a dove that the Spirit was coming down into Jesus or on Jesus? Because we wouldn't believe that the Spirit was given to us at baptism unless we first saw it in a physical way. And likewise, God uh, put, put everything that happened together in the Old Testament for us to foreshadow what our spiritual lives would be like in New Testament times. God's physical people, the Israelites, and God's spiritual people, Christians, disciples. You with me? Because of this, though, the Jews thought that they were saved simply because they were Jews. Well, you can't just be saved just because you're a Jew. You've got to become a Christian. And because they did not agree with Christianity, they began to persecute God's spiritual people. And Jesus goes, they are a synagogue of Satan. You know, the Christians at this time were already being persecuted by the Roman Empire. In fact, Revelation was written during one of the most harshest and most intense persecutions ever recorded in history under Emperor Domitian. And yet, not only do we find that they were experiencing persecution on behalf of the Roman Empire, but through this scripture, we can see that they were experiencing persecution also on behalf of of the Jewish people. The Jews that would not accept the spiritual realities of the New Testament started to persecute Christians. Well, what's the message for the church in Smyrna? Well, the message is quite simple. Be faithful even to the point of death. You know, very interestingly, in Smyrna, there's a famous historical uh, figure named Polycarp. And Polycarp was a disciple in the second century, in 155 AD, in fact, he was the leader of the church in Smyrna. And historically speaking, uh, it's recorded that they were having uh, games or Olympics in Smyrna, as they, they often did throughout the Roman Empire. And someone in the crowd cried out, away with the atheist, referring actually to the Christians. Let Polycarp, uh, Polycarp be searched for. Well, it's recorded that the police captain arrested Polycarp, but was moved by him and didn't want him to die. And so he pleaded for Polycarp to, to say Caesar is Lord and not Jesus is Lord. Because at that time, if you said Jesus is Lord, it meant Caesar was not and you were going to get killed. But if you said Caesar was Lord and, and uh, committed apostasies where, where you deny Jesus, then you are allowed to live. Well, he was brought before the proconsul at the arena there in Smyrna. The proconsul says, Curse the name of Christ and sacrifice to Caesar or die. And Polycarp's response was, 86 years I've served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul threatened him again and this time he threatened him with burning Polycarp alive. Polycarp responds, You threaten me with fire that burns for a short time and is quickly quenched. For you do not know the fire that awaits the wicked in judgment to come and in everlasting punishment. Why are you waiting? Come, do what you will. According to the legend, 
Now, this is not historically recorded, but it is kind of recorded as a legend. Polycarp was burned alive, but the flames did not harm his flesh. Instead, a Roman executioner had to step forward and stab him to death with a sword. That's what it means, my brothers and sisters, to be faithful to the Lord, to have the heart that Polycarp had. You know, I'm going to ask you this morning, as you consider your own spiritual walk with God, do you complain when things don't go exactly your way as a disciple? I mean, consider what Polycarp had to do to stand up for his faith, even in the midst of being burned alive. And yet so often we can complain about some of the smallest little things in our Christian lives, our Christian walk with God. Do you quit when you get a little rejection when you're sharing your faith? Do you get easily discouraged? You see, we've got to take a lesson from Polycarp, and we've got to have the heart to be faithful, to persevere no matter what. You know, last week at church, you know, it's kind of funny to me. Every time I, I preach a sermon, I always wonder how God is going to test me with the exact message that I've shared with other people. And last week, I, I, I talked a, a little bit about learning how to, to love more. And part of my own personal uh, walk with God is to learn how to be more patient in love. And it was funny because right after church, I was literally uh, driving out of the parking lot to go to Shema and Daniel's baptism. And I heard a noise and, you know, my tire sensor wasn't going off. And so I didn't think anything of it. But as I kept on driving, I heard the noise get louder. And turns out I had a flat tire. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I just hate when I have car trouble. It's one of the most annoying things in the world. And so there I was, I just preached on having patience, and, and I'm going, all right, this is a test from God. Okay, this is a test from God. He's testing my patience. Well, I, I got in the car, and I started to try to figure out how to change the tire, and I'm super grateful for Nero and Kamar uh, being there to help me as well, but also Shema was there. And as I got in the car, and I'm, I'm feeling that, you know, the, the annoyance of the, the flat tire, but also having in the back of my mind that God is testing my patience, I just happened to look up and I saw Shema standing right there. And I thought about Shema and all that Shema had to do uh, to overcome Satan trying to stop him getting baptized. Uh, I mean, in some ways, uh, it was a challenge for him. He had to not only accept that what he had been doing in his life and his, his uh, own beliefs were, were wrong according to the scriptures, but he also had to move all the way to Toronto from Montreal. And so I'm considering this and I'm thinking about this and I had two thoughts. Number one, I started to think, wow, Satan is giving me a flat tire. This is just another thing Satan is doing to stop Shema from being baptized. I mean, look in the scripture right here. The Bible says in verse 10, the devil will put some of you into prison to test you. Well, what does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean that, that Satan was literally going to show up and escort people to prison, but, but he was going to work through people of that time to put disciples into prison. Satan's influence was going to go through people to put people into prison. And I thought about the fact that Satan was trying to stop Shema from being baptized. And I realized, you know, Satan, Satan does, yes, God is going to test us, but Satan is also at work in our lives. And I, 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 I was able to kind of come to terms with the fact that Satan was really trying to get Shema not baptized, but also trying to take me out through the flat tire. But the second thought I had, was wow, if Shema can have such a great attitude, having come all the way from Montreal to be baptized here in Toronto, and then being held up by a flat tire, and going through all the challenges that, that he's gone through, man, I need to make sure that I'm faithful too, and not let Satan take us out. Yes, God is testing us, and yes, Satan is trying to take us out constantly. But we've got to be faithful, and we've got to make sure to persevere, like the disciples had to persevere in Smyrna. Let's go to the third church, the church in Pergamum. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. He says to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some of you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. 
Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Well, what a message right here to the church in Pergamum. Jesus goes, I know where you live. You go, well, that's awesome. God knows where I live. But then he goes, it's where Satan has his throat. Oh, well, that, that's not awesome at all. You ever feel like Satan has a throne in your life or Satan has a throne in the city that we're living in that you can't get anywhere because Satan's just so much at work? Well, that was the sense that people got there in Pergamum. Now, it's very interestingly or interesting because historically, uh, just before this time, about 800 years earlier, there was a, an 800 foot tall altar built for Zeus, the, the Greek god Zeus. Uh, and it was built on a, a hill that looked a lot like a throne. And, and so you can see the message that Jesus is giving to the church there. That this is where Satan has his throne. What's the point? Any false doctrine, any false teaching, even though sometimes taught by very sincere people, is satanic. And right here in the church in Pergamum, there were two main false doctrines that were taught. One was the teaching of Balaam in verse 14, and the other was the, the practices of the Nicolaitans. You go, well, what did, what did Balaam ta uh, teach? Well, back in the Old Testament, you know, the story where the, the donkey rebukes Balaam? Balaam was actually a prophet of God who was bribed by a foreign king to betray God's people and curse God's people. Well, Balaam knew that if he cursed God's people, that God would curse him. And so he chose not to curse God's people, but instead, he told the king how to take out God's people. He goes, look, if you just entice God's people with sin, God will curse them for you. You don't even have to put a curse on God's people. God will do it. And so literally, uh, Balak, the, the prophet who, or, or, or the person who enticed the prophet, the, uh, Balaam, uh, literally sent his women into the Israelite camp to entice the Israelites into sin. And, and just like Balaam prophesied, God cursed his people because of what Balaam told Balak to do. Well, what was the teaching or the practices of Nicolaitans? Well, some scholars believe that this false teaching was started by Nicholas, one of the seven church leaders chosen in Acts 6 to take care of the widows who are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Well, essentially, the, the Nicolaitans believed in a, a cheap grace. That you could do anything you want, and God's grace is so awesome that it could cover you, and you don't have to actually try to repent. They believe that the body is evil, and so therefore, uh, anything you do in the body is going to be killed with its, its evil self, and so you can get away with doing anything. You can commit sexual acts, and, and there's no uh, consequence, there's no spiritual discipline for it, uh, because God's grace is so awesome, and because your body is just so evil. And Jesus goes, I will soon come to you and fight against these doctrines, them, with the sword of my mouth. You go, well, what is the sword that Jesus is referring to? But we know in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible is referred to as a double-edged sword. What's the point? If you're going to overcome false doctrine in your life, and let's be honest, there's a lot of false doctrine that's taught in today's version of Christianity. Cheap grace? Absolutely. The teachings of Balaam, uh, where Satan is literally trying to entice God's people? Absolutely. And if we're going to overcome the false doctrines of our day, like the disciples here in Pergamum had to overcome the false doctrines in their day, it's only going to happen if we know and we preach the Word of God. You with me right here, church? You know, uh, recently, we were doing a Bible study with a, a guy on campus and, uh, you know, we, we shared with him, a uh, guy grew up Catholic and, and uh, was really convinced of the false teachings of infant baptism and original sin. Well, we, we shared the Bible with him and he was just so blown away. And almost immediately, in fact, even in the middle of our Bible study, he started to research on Google uh, the difference between what he had grown up being taught and what the Bible really says. 
And he goes, hey, what about the severed sacraments in Catholicism? Is that in the Bible? He goes, absolutely not. He looks it up, and sure enough, on the internet even, it says, yeah, we know that these are not in the Bible, but they're things that we've practiced for hundreds of years. He goes, this is crazy. This is so different from what I've learned, and, and, and it's so obvious when you just read the Bible. Well, sadly, um, over time, he, he started to kind of branch out and talk to more people about it because he's just so blown away by what he was being taught. And, and eventually, he found somebody that he knew that just turns out to have uh, grown up and, and been in the ICOC. And so he reached out to Tim uh, Kasosi and he goes, hey, bro, or hey, Tim, um, what's the difference between you guys, the ICC, and the ICOC? And that's a hard thing to explain in some ways, but, but it's very simple. They believe the same thing in, in, on paper or in practice, in, in, in truth. They, they believe the same doctrine. But, but you could, you could or, or more or less, you could, you could pretty much uh, separate the two, the ICC with the ICOC, by just simply asking one question. Why did your friend in the ICOC that you grew up with never try to make you into a disciple? That's the only way we can defeat false doctrine. And it's shocking to think that you as a Catholic grew up with this guy in the ICOC your entire life and never once did he break out the word of God and try to help you to come to terms with the truth. But you know, sadly, we can be like that sometimes as disciples too. There are people around us that are, are completely bought into and sold out to false doctrines. And, and some of us don't even open the Bible to teach them or to confront the truth. You know, we live in a culture here in Canada where we just don't want to make any waves. We, we don't want to upset anybody. But you know, at the end of the day, if you're a doctor and you don't treat a patient that, that's dying, you're held responsible for the fact that that person died and you did nothing to help them. That, that's called a medical negligence. You can get in trouble for that. You can use your, lose your medical license. You can even be put in prison if there's someone that's dying around you and you do nothing to help them. Likewise, if we're really disciples, if we really call ourselves God's movement, God's people, then we've got to make sure that we fight against false teaching with the word, the true word of God. Amen? You know, don't tell me that you're a disciple if you're surrounded by people that are not Christians and you haven't tried to help them. But likewise, don't tell me that there are people around you that are disciples if you're not being helped to follow God's word. You see, that was the issue there in Pergamum they were taken out by the false teachings, the false doctrines of their time. Let's keep going. Let's go to the church in Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says, To the church and the to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and your faith and your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Is that awesome right there? They were doing more as they aged spiritually than they had done when they first started out as Christians. And that's really how it should be for us as we age spiritually. We're able to do more because our faith is greater. Our knowledge is greater. Uh, we've, we've built greater character as, as we've grown and gone through hardship as Christians. And so we should be doing more as we age spiritually. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teachings, she misleads my servants in a sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and make those who committed adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and will repay each of you according to your deeds." Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not want to hold to our teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any of the burden on you except to hold on to what you have, have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that, the, that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says 
to the churches. You know, right here, Jesus had a message for the church in Thyatira. He says, I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. You know, what a contrast to the church in Ephesus who had forsaken their first love and, and stopped doing as much as they had done earlier in their faith as they aged in their faith. Well, the church in Thyatira was doing more than they had done at first. And yet Jesus goes, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have tolerated that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. You know, I think one of the misconceptions that we can sometimes have when we read this scripture is to go, oh, wow, the church in Thyatira had a problem with sin. That's what Jesus was confronting right here, their, their problem or their issue with sin. <coughs> that was not the issue right here in Thyatira. Yes, there was sin in the church, but there's always sin in the church. The problem with the church in Thyatira was the fact that they tolerated the sin in the church. You see, as a church, we are sinful people. That's what the church is made up of. And guess what sinful people do best? We sin. That there's always going to be sin in the church because there are always sinners in the church. Amen? But, but one of the things that we've got to make sure that we're careful of is that we don't get into the habit of tolerating sin in the church. See, that's what separates a true church of Jesus Christ and, and the regular denominational church that you see down the street is that when we see sin, what we call it out and we hold each other accountable so that we can help each other follow the word of God and ultimately get to heaven. You know, I know that um, in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, the Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. But, but then after the Bible says we baptize them, the Bible says that we teach them to obey everything that we've been commanded. Well, it doesn't say just teach them everything. It says teach them to obey everything. And let me tell you, there's a big difference between teaching the Word of God. A lot of churches teach the Word of God and teaching people to obey the Word of God. That means that we've got to be in each other's lives, encouraging one another, correcting one another, rebuking one another, and ultimately training one another through God's Word to live the life of a Christian. You know, I'll never forget, you know, a couple years back when Wally and Sheehan first started coming to church. In fact, their first church service uh, just so happened to be a church service where we were, were uh, uh, unfortunately, having to institute Matthew 18 and um, do a step four of church discipline on someone where we literally were disfellowshipping them from the church. And I'll never forget because, you know, when, when there are visitors at church and you're, you're doing a step three or a step four of church discipline, you're always kind of wondering, I wonder how this is going to impact those visiting in the church. And so, you know, I went and talked to, to Wally and Shun in the fellowship, and, and they shared, they go, wow, we've always seen this verse in the Bible, but this is the first time we've ever seen someone actually put it into practice. You see, in the Bible, there's a method for us to deal with sin. Number one, we, we confront one another one-on-one. -on -one. That, that happens all the time in the church. When we see sin, we have to say something as watchmen, Ezekiel 3.17. And if we don't say something when we see other people in sin, then the Bible says that we can be held accountable for their sin. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be held accountable for other people's sin. I've got enough sin of my own that I've got to repent of and work on. Amen? But step two is that when someone doesn't listen to us when we confront them, but we pull in another brother, preferably a more mature brother, that can help mediate the situation. Maybe we're wrong in what we're seeing, and they can help us see correctly. Or maybe the other person is being stubborn and obstinate and doesn't want to change, and they can help uh, push them and persuade them to change and to repent. Step three is that when, when that doesn't work, you bring them before the church. And this is done in a very loving way, but ultimately it's to help everyone in the church know what's going on so that they can pray for the individual, but, but also to help the individual to wake up and see the seriousness of their sin. And then unfortunately, if that doesn't work, if there's no repentance, then the Bible says that there's a step four. A step four, uh, in, in, in most cases, is just a removal of the membership or a kicking out of the church of an individual who has not chosen to repent. Because at the end of the day, that's what disciples do. We repent 
as soon as we stop repenting, we're, we're no longer disciples. Now, for certain sins, 1 Corinthians 5 talks about immorality, idolatry, gross impurity, etc. Or even in, in Titus, it talks about divisiveness. For certain sins, the, the consequence is a little bit more harsh and severe because we have to protect God's family. And in that case, they're disfellowshipped, are removed from the fellowship, and, and we're not allowed or we don't have any contact with them. Why? Because we want to make sure that we protect the sheep, we protect the flock, God's people. You with me here? You know, I remember talking a while back with another church leader uh, from another church and uh, was not a part of our movement. And sadly, this is a very lukewarm church. And I was talking to this church leader and, uh, you know, he was, he was very open that there was a lot of problems in his church. I said, well, hey, you know, that's normal. There's a lot of problems in all of our churches. But I said, well, what are you doing to solve the problems? And he looks at me and I'll never forget what he says. He goes, you know, Evan, you're young. You've got a young family, so you probably don't understand this. But when your kids get older and they start messing up in their teenage years and things like that, you don't just kick them out of the family. And that was his thinking. And I responded to him. I said, no, I don't, I don't think you understand. You see, what makes us God's family is the fact that we repent and are following God's word. As soon as we stop repenting and stop following God's word, then over time, we're, we're no longer going to be a part of God's family. And so if you don't actually deal with people's sin, then, then you're actually creating a, a church full of non-Christians because nobody's dealing with sin. And so those sinners are lost. But because you're not dealing with it, you're held accountable for their sin because, because the Bible says that we've got to be watchmen for one another. You see, I believe that for us as disciples, well, we're not perfect, but we've got to make sure that we're repenting and that we see other people's imperfections and help them to repent as well. You know, I, I think that, truth be told, in recent months, you know, we, we've got some things that we need to work on in our own church. Now, I know that over the last year, it's been a challenge to figure out how to operate uh, throughout COVID, the pandemic. And sadly, though, I, I think that some of us have gotten a little too comfortable behind a computer screen. Now, I just want to be a brother, and I want to call it out. Because that's what the Bible says we need to do, is that we need to make sure that we don't tolerate sin. Sadly, I think that for some, they don't want to be inconvenienced, and so it's, it's more convenient to watch church from behind a screen rather to, than to show up in person. Now, I think that in some cases, uh, for things like Bible talks and deed times, uh, Zoom has become a great tool for us to use. But, but now I think it's become also a crutch for some of us because we've gotten comfortable in our faith, and we've got to repent of our, our comfortability and choose to be discomforted for the sake of prioritizing God's kingdom over our own comfort. Bottom line, if you want to go to heaven in person, you better show up to church in person. Amen? Let's go to the church in Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, right here, Jesus just lays it out to the church in Sardis. He says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are, in fact, dead. You know, uh, recently I was reading on Twitter, uh, which I know is not the most reliable source for news, but I was reading on Twitter about this city in China called Zaipu. And uh, in fact, it's, it's one of China's most popular tourist de destinations because of its picturesque landscapes and, and its towns and just how awesome it looks. Uh, tons of photos all over the internet of this city, Zaipu. Well, the problem is that all of the pictures of this town are actually staged and are fake. 
they've been photoshopped, they've been created in studio or just with lighting and things like that to promote visiting this city. But the reality of the city is much different than what people see in the photographs. And of course, it was marketed and staged this way so that the people of Zaipu and, 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 and specifically those that uh, offer tours and things like that could make a few bucks. And so the rest of the world thinks there's this amazing city in China, a great tourist destination to, to visit. And it's got a great reputation in a sense for being a lot. But if you were to go to Zaipu, you would find that its reputation for being alive is simply a reputation. And in fact, the city is, quote, dead. It's not the real representation uh, or a, a true representation of the city that's out there on media. You go, why would the people of Sardis have a reputation of being alive if they're dead? I mean, how would people think, or why would people think that they're alive if the reality of their situation is they were dead? Well, in verse 4, it says you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, where they are worthy. You know, all things considered, although overall the church was dead, there, there were some sold out disciples in that church that were making things happen. The Bible says different than those that were dead. These disciples had not soiled their clothes. They were walking with God dressed in white. And the Bible says that they were worthy. They are worthy. Worthy disciples. Bottom line is those that were dead spiritually were riding the coattails of those that were actually cranking for the Lord. You know, one of the things I, I love to do is watch sports. And I can get into almost any sports. In fact, every time the Olympics comes on, I, I find myself watching some of the weirdest sports just because I love competition. And, uh, you know, I can get so into sports that I can think that, that when my team wins, I'm winning. I don't know if you can relate to me on that. You know, I love LeBron James. And I love watching the Lakers play. I love football. And, you know, recently I've, I've been really becoming a fan of Tom Brady. And just to see him win another Super Bowl ring is incredible. And I, I hope he does the same thing next year to really create a, a, an amazing legacy. But, you know, it's a funny uh, phenomenon that happens when, when my team wins. And I don't know if you can relate to me on this, but when my team wins, I feel like I win. You know, when my team loses, I feel like I lose and I get all upset and I get, you know, emotional about the fact that my team's lost, even though I had nothing to do with their loss. Likewise, when my team wins, I feel like, man, I'm victorious. I won. My team won. It was my team. Even though, again, I had nothing to do with their victory. And that's the power of sports. We can get so emotionally wrapped up in things like sports and we can feel like we're a part of the victory of the team that we support. In truth, though, we're not actually contributing to their victory. We're just on the couch eating potato chips, drinking our soda, or, or eating popcorn, or whatever it is that we, we do while we're watching a game. And we have nothing to do with whether or not our team wins or whether or not our team loses. In fact, our team doesn't even know we exist. That's the difference between being a fan versus being a player. And too often, I think, we can feel like we're really contributing to the work of God, that we're really doing it, that we're really building God's church. And, and in truth, though, we're more of a fan of the kingdom of God than a player in the kingdom of God. Yeah, we're happy to cheer on other brothers and happy to cheer on baptisms and happy to cheer on one another as we continue to work for the Lord. But, but as individuals, we're just kind of sitting on the couch, metaphorically speaking, eating our potato chips and not being a part of all the action of the kingdom of God. And yes, we can have a reputation of being alive, but that doesn't mean that we are actually alive. And sometimes we can have a reputation for being alive. And when in fact, the truth and the reality of our own circumstance is that we are dead spiritually. You know, it's been amazing uh, to see God work this year in our church. You know, at the beginning of the year, we, we set a goal that we were going to see 30 people baptized into Christ. And I'll never forget being up at, at Stucco Lake uh, in Tweed and, and just preaching that and, and the church's response to those, quote, untouchable goals that we thought were, were so lofty. And it's incredible because here we are halfway through the year, just having closed out June, the six-month mark, the, the really the halfway point of a year, and already we've seen 15 souls 
baptized into Christ. Absolutely, God is working to help us reach our goals. And I think the church is doing incredible overall, but, but I do want to say this. I don't think in truth that we're anywhere close to what we're capable of doing as a church. I think that there are some who have not sold their clothes and are working hard, but I think that there are also some of us who have become fans of the kingdom of God and have stopped being players in the kingdom of God. And it's time for us to wake up, to repent, and to start getting in the action because the, the work here in Toronto is not yet finished. Let's go to our next church. Let's go to the church in Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus goes to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And when he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Is that cranking or not? I know you have little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are, are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command and endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them uh, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, what an incredible message Jesus gives to the church in Philadelphia. He goes, I, I know you have little strength, but you have kept my word. You know, the Greek word right here for Philadelphos is the one who loves his brothers. And so that's why even in, in the English translation of that word, Philadelphia, we know it as the city of brotherly love. You know, hopefully we have some Philadelphos listening in this morning that just really love our brothers and our sisters, really love the family that God has given us spiritually. Amen? Well, interestingly, this is the only church out of the seven churches of Asia that Jesus does not say anything negative about. You know, you would, you would think that in a way, because there are no criticisms that Jesus gives to the church right here, that it was a strong church. But the Bible says, I know that you have little strength. Isn't that amazing? That you can have a little strength in a way and still be someone that God looks up to or God fire, is fired up about. You know, uh, the historically speaking, the city of Philadelphia right here in Asia was riddled by earthquakes. In fact, the, the city was destroyed or most of the city was destroyed in 17 AD shortly before this by a, a great earthquake. And although it had been rebuilt, there were a lot of little tremors that kept on going on in the city. And so much of the foundation of the city, the houses that people lived in, were just real with, with cracks everywhere. The foundations were shaky, etc. And so you could see kind of the analogy that Jesus is making of the people, the church there in Philadelphia, in a city that had been so messed up and destroyed and had cracks in it. A, a lot of, quote, weakness, very little strength. That's how the disciples were too. They had little strength, but you know what? They really loved each other. And they really loved God. And so Jesus goes to the one who is victorious. I will make a pillar in the temple of God. You see, you don't have to have a lot of strength to get Jesus fired up. You just got to really love the family of God. And you got to really love the Lord. You know, I, I love our singles ministry. And I, I just want to boast in the Lord a little bit uh, about our singles ministry. You know, uh, about a year ago, I would say that our singles ministry was the weakest ministry in the church. In fact, uh, by the end of last year, my wife and I thought that it was time for us to really get involved with the singles ministry and, and get it going because there was a lot of disciples just frankly weren't, weren't doing much spiritually. And we got into the singles ministry and it was incredible to see that the hearts were, were so excited to learn and to grow. And, and there was a very, very quick repentance. And uh, very shortly after... 
uh, we got in there with the singles ministry and st started to work with Nero and Amber and Rich and Deshara and some of the other disciples in the singles ministry. The singles ministry started to baptize. And in fact, uh, I'm so ex inspired by them because at this point, out of our 15 baptisms, over half of them, eight, have come from our singles ministry. Although, in a sense, last year they were a group of, quote, little strength, they really have, in some ways, become a pillar in our church. And that can be true of any of us. God can take us, even though we may have little strength, and turn us into a pillar for Him, as long as we're committed to loving one another and loving the Lord. You know, I love uh, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. In 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, <clears throat> You don't have to turn there, but the Bible simply says that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, strengthening those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. That God's eyes are looking for people. God is actively searching for people who are, who are not necessarily strong people, but who are willing to be committed. And the Bible says he's searching, searching for those people whose hearts will be fully committed to him. And once he gets those people, he's going to strengthen them up spiritually. And the cool thing about that is that no matter where you're at, whether you have a lot of strength or a little strength, you can choose to be committed and therefore be strengthened by the Lord. And that was Jesus' message to the church in Philadelphia. That we don't have to have a lot of strength. We just got to be fully committed to the Lord and God will use us and eventually he'll turn us into a pillar for his kingdom. Amen. Let's go to our last church, the church, and perhaps the most famous church in Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. We read on right here. The Bible says to the angel in the church, you let us hear right. These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth. I, I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you become rich. And white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, um, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, right here, in contrast to the church in uh, Philadelphia, uh, which, which God only offered encouragement to, and, and really Jesus had no criticism for. In the church in Laodicea, Jesus has no encouragement for them. In fact, he only has criticism for them. You know, historically speaking, Laodicea was located six miles away from the city of Heropolis. And in Heropolis, there was a hot water spring that people would travel to. And so they'd go six miles and they'd collect water from this hot water spring, thinking that they would have hot water. They would then bring it home. But as they traveled the six-mile journey from Heropolis back to Laodicea, that, that hot water became lukewarm over time. And nobody wants to drink or use lukewarm water. Amen? You know, uh, uh, it's funny. Uh, last week when we were in Tweed and we were staying there at the Stokoe Lake Lodge, uh, getting ready for the wedding, uh, you know, we went to take a shower. And I don't know if you had this experience in your room if you were staying there at the lodge as well, but we went to take a shower and, and the shower was, you know, kind of warm at first. But within a few seconds there at the lodge, it went either really cold or really hot. It was either one or the other. And, and usually it was on the really cold side. And so my poor kids were in the shower and all of a sudden the water went from warm to cold. The same thing with my wife. She got in the shower and there was no hot water. And, and come to find out that the reason why there was no hot water is because Isaiah's cousin was taking at the same time a 45 minute long hot shower. Somehow he got hot water and it took the hot water away from all the other showers there. 
at least in our room or, or the rooms around us. You know, you, you know when you're in cold water and you know when you're in hot water. You know, in the Greek words, the cold uh, word or the word for cold right here is the word sucros, which really means in the Greek, cold to the point of freezing. The word for hot right here is the Greek word zestos, which means hot to the point of boiling. And so what is Jesus' point right here? Either you're freezing cold spiritually or you're burning hot, boiling hot spiritually, and everything in the middle is lukewarmness. You know, I want to ask this morning, have you been hot spiritually? Have you been cold spiritually? Or have you found it nice and comfortable right there in the middle? You see, the thing about being in lukewarmness is that you don't sometimes know that you're in lukewarmness. It's so comfortable. It feels so good to stay there in lukewarmness. And, and, and we, we cannot even realize where we're at spiritually. You know, right here, the Bible says that Jesus is on the outside of this church knocking because he's trying to get back in. Now, we know that there is a false doctrine that's taken from this scripture, the idea that you could say a prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. That's not in the Bible. There's no example of it in the scriptures. In fact, this is a teaching that historically only, only came about within the last 300 years of, quote, Christianity. And so because, though, I think there's a false teaching taken from the scripture, as disciples, sometimes we can avoid this scripture and not look at what the Bible is actually saying. The Bible saying, is saying that Jesus is spirit. Jesus is on the outside of this church building, knocking, trying to get back in because of the lukewarmness it was in the, the church right there. And, and Jesus' point is, hey, if you just repent, if you can get hot spiritually, boiling hot, zestos, then Jesus will come back into the church and be with the church and work in the church once again. Brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that we are hot spiritually, that we don't give in to being spiritually frozen, and we certainly don't give in to being spiritually lukewarm, but that we are fired up to work and to serve the Lord because we know that it pleases God, and ultimately is that, that's what keeps God's Spirit working in our church. You know, overall, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know which of these churches relates to you as an individual. But I do know that no matter where you're at spiritually, you can make a decision to be victorious. In Revelation 2 verse 7, Jesus says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In Revelation 2 and verse 11, the Bible says to the one who is victorious, what will not be hurt at all by the second death. In chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus says, To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. In Revelation 2 and verse 26, the Bible says, To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Is that cranking? In Revelation 3, 5, he says, To the one who is victorious, uh, I will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. In chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, To the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. And finally, in Revelation 3 verse 21, he says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. I mean, what an incredible visual that Jesus gives the church in the first century. What an incredible visual Jesus gives us as a church in the 21st century. That we could eventually victor be victorious to the point where we could sit with Jesus on his throne in heaven. You see, Jesus wants us to be victorious. You can be victorious. We can be victorious. Let us learn from Jesus' message to the seven churches. Let us preach the message of victory in our church. And let us preach the message of victory to a lost world. For then, and only then, we truly would be victorious. I love you guys this morning. God bless you all. I love you.